Good afternoon. For those of you that are just joining us, welcome. For those that were taking part in the morning sessions, welcome back. Um, my name is Kayla McCulley, class of 2009, and Assistant Director of Alumni and Parent Engagement here at Pomona. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the third session of what is turning out to be a wonderful program of speakers today at Seaver Theater. Um, on your programs, you'll see that this session is followed by a panel of Claremont alumni in media and entertainment, uh, most notably our very own Sage Hen um, actor Richard Chamberlain, class of 1956. So we hope you'll consider staying with us before the rest of the exciting events this evening. I am delighted to introduce Mary Schmeek, class of 1975, and Julia Thomas. Yeah, she's got a fan club. My this people out there. <laughs> Julia is Scripps, class of 2017, and she is the editor-in-chief of The Student Life, which is the five-college student newspaper, as you know. Mary has worked as a journalist for the Chicago Tribune since 1985, writing on topics ranging from humorous reflections to in-depth reporting on all sorts of topics. I'm personally honored to offer this introduction because it really feels like I've come full circle. Mary was the graduation speaker at my own commencement in 2009, so I have memories sitting there in my cap and gown and listening to her um, deliver what was quite a, a wonderful speech at that time. Um, this year, Mary is a recipient of the Blaisdell Distinguished Alumni Award, one of the college's most prestigious awards bestowed upon graduates who carry the spirit of the college to the rest of the world and live up to the inscription on the college gates. They only are loyal to this college who, departing, bear their added riches in trust for mankind. The title of her most well-known piece, a 1997 column called Wear Sunscreen, which became an internet and radio sensation, seems especially appropriate advice for all of us this weekend. So <laughs> I urge you to bear that in mind. Uh, please join me in welcoming Mary Schmeek and Julia Thomas. Hello, everyone. So we'll just start out by kind of talking about, um, Mary, how your time has been back at Pomona. How does it feel to be back here after and in, in all the times that you graduated? Well, you know, I worked at Pomona. My first job out of college, because I didn't know what I wanted to do when I got out of college, was working at Pomona College. <laughs> so I was in the admissions office here for three years and um, made some friendships here that have uh, stayed with me. Um, and one of my best friends, Eleanor Brown, teaches here, class of 75. And uh, my wonderful French professor, Virginia Crosby, is here. A special salute to her. So coming to Claremont feels like coming home to me, um, except it's just so darn hot. Yeah. <laughs> A nice break from Chicago, right. perhaps. Right. Yeah. Um, and just being back here, what are some of your fondest memories of the college and times that you've had here as a student? You know, I, I was flipping through some of my old columns today, and I, and I realized I wrote, I wrote one not long ago after one of these happiness surveys uh, about college happiness was, was issued. And Pomona is often at the top of, of that. But every time I read one of those happiness in college surveys, I think, what is wrong with you people? You don't go to college to be happy. <laughs> College is where you get in touch with your misery. <laughs> it's where you learn to be lonely. It's where you, you fall in love and fall out of love. And, and you have all the trauma in your life that later you will return into fond memories. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm not sure really. I mean, I, I loved Pomona. I had a great time at Pomona. But when I think about was I actually happy in the day to day? No, I remember walking around behind Wig Hall and crying a fair amount. <laughs> The, the sad but true reality of right. being a college student. Um, and I know also when you worked, um, when you were a student here at Pomona, you worked at the Student Life newspaper in kind of your first foray into journalism. So, Which you now call TSL. Yes, this is true. Um, we've now become a 5C newspaper, whereas the... And I told you, she speaks in text. First time she said to me, a 5C newspaper, she said it several times, and I said, um, what is 5C? <laughs> it's true. Five college, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so what do you remember about working for the student life and what did you enjoy? The first thing I remember when I hear the word student life is Roy Savage, my co-editor, also class of 75, coming in about 10 p.m. on the day before the paper was supposed to come out with a bottle of wild turkey, <laughs> putting it on the desk, putting his cowboy boots up on the desk, <laughs> and then we got to work. 
<laughs> it was a very primitive operation in those days. It was cut and paste, rubber cement. You, I don't even remember the terms for all of this. I was trying to remember. Does anybody remember? You, 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 you took the galleys and you had the rubber cement and you pasted them on some paper. But what was the word for the little tape? You had different kinds of tapes, tapes that looked like stars, tapes that were just stripes. And this is how you delineated. This is how you made art on your pages. Um, we still had a couple of manual typewriters. There were no computers. It was a long time ago, Julia. <laughs> I must say we don't typically have wild turkey during <laughs> publication <laughs> nights, <laughs> but the other parts of the publication process are somewhat similar in the, the, just the whole effort of doing and putting out a newspaper. Um, and just to introduce us to um, what you do as a journalist, um, why don't you read us something that you've written? Okay. Um, I was thinking as I, I was coming over here, you know, what, what I might read. And I've written so many columns, thousands of columns, and so many different kinds of columns that it's hard to pick one. Um, but the one I've picked is about my mother. I have, through 22 years of column writing, inadvertently, at least inadvertently to begin, written a lot about my mother and somehow chronicled my mother's life and my mother's death and the aftermath of my mother's death. So I wanted to read just one of those that has to do with the topic at hand. One day you too, Julia. <laughs> <laughs> I call this canceling my mother's newspaper. With a traitor's leaden heart, I recently canceled my mother's subscription to her local newspaper. I'd anticipated harder tasks when I went to Oregon a couple of weeks ago to start dismantling her home. Friends who had already gone through this kind of ritual had warned me, pace yourself. Saying goodbye to the tangible evidence of a parent's life can be exhausting. You might stumble on things you don't want to know. You'll find things you can't bear to discard but can't stand to keep. And the dust. I walked into the house girded for battle and was surprised when the days passed in what felt like meditation. I spent peaceful hours sitting on a box in the garage or on some closet floor, sifting, usually in silence. I discovered all those times that I'd phoned my mother and she said, I'm getting organized for my death. She was telling the truth. She had gathered precious documents in a little green metal box, her birth certificate and marriage certificate, my father's death certificate, the bill for his coffin. In a yellow plastic file, she had assembled a lifetime of psychological evaluations of my youngest sister, who had always lived with her. She had created cardboard folders for each of her children, eight in total. And then each one inserted school photos, report cards, letters. I was perversely delighted to see my eighth grade C in conduct. <laughs> and every morning while I sorted and pondered, the newspaper landed outside the house. For the first couple of days when I opened the front door, the paper startled me. It lay there like a ghost, an intruder from a vanished time. I could still see my mother bending over, picking it up. The newspaper, the Eugene Register Guard, had been my mother's morning sun, and fetching it was a first act in her day. She always spent at least an hour with it, musing on the news, agreeing or disagreeing with the columnists, clipping her favorite stories. The climax was the daily crossword puzzle. She asked for it even on the morning she died. Now she was gone, and the paper kept coming. And it unnerved me in a way nothing else in the house had. I had to cancel it, but how could I? My mother belonged to a generation that loved printed newspapers in a way no one will again. What we now call newspapers will live and prosper, but they'll do it in a different way, maybe one day without paper. And they're unlikely to command the single-minded dedication of my mother's generation. 
Canceling her paper would feel to me like canceling her history, newspaper history, and my own past as a newspaper writer. So at first I tossed the paper on the sofa unread. I had other things to do. Finally, though, I started reading it and liking it. It was a mix of national stories from good news services and local stories from a smart staff that was clearly working very hard. I liked the fact that it was one of the few papers still run by a family. All of that made it even harder to cancel, so I waited until I got back to Chicago. If you ever want to resubscribe, said the nice man who answered when I called, just let us know. I hung up, hoping that some young person would subscribe instead and see what she'd been missing. Thank you, Mary. Your call was wonderful. Um, and just, it touches on, I think, um, something in today's world that my generation and future generations will never have the experience of loving as much. Um, you touch on a nostalgia, but also an undying love for newspapers in print form. What do you think about that? And what do you think about newspapers in today's world and going forward? I need you to tell me that. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, you know, this has been the great uh, ongoing mystery of the newspaper industry for, for years now. I mean, when this mystery emerged 10, 12 years ago, I think we thought that it would be solved by now, right? That somebody was going to come up with a model that was going to get this all settled. And the epiphany that I've had recently is that it will never be settled. Because things change so quickly now that whatever model might be found that would work this month, in a year, two years, that's not going to work anymore. So, you know, I think for those of us who came up in a, in a world, in a less accelerated world, though compared to what our parents grew up with, hugely accelerated, um, it's really hard for us to, to fathom what the next thing is. But I think those of you who have come up in a time where you're just, you know, you were used to constant flux, I think, in a way that the old folks, the reading glass crowd, <laughs> is not. Yeah, it certainly is a time of transition. Um, and even when, so when you were a student coming from Pomona with a French major and with a, educa the education, that, the liberal arts education that we get here, what, it, what intrigued you about journalism and what made you interested in going into the field? My first job out of college, as, as I said, was in the Pomona College admissions office. And I realized, little by little, that the things that I really liked about working in the admissions office were things that were involved in journalism. I loved traveling around, going into high schools, making my pitch to high school students, and then coming back and writing up the interview notes. Nothing made me happier than writing up the interview notes and describing the mountains behind Sandia High School. <laughs> Um, and then sitting down and interviewing students who came to Pomona. I just loved talking to them and asking them questions and writing up their interview notes and trying to psychoanalyze them. So the combination of travel, interviewing people, and then writing it up. I mean, those are your basic journalism skills, right? And then um, a close friend of mine, also class of 75, suggested that I go to journalism school and he sent me applications while I was living in France. I applied. And then suddenly I was a journalist. And I think I've had to learn what journalism can do. You know, I went into it because I loved those elements of it. And over time, I've come to understand the opportunities, the possibilities that writing in that public way provide. Um, and what are some of those challenges that you've encountered? Um, especially as a woman working in journalism? You know, when I went into journalism, I didn't really think about being a woman in journalism. It's only after years of being one that I realized, A, when I got into the field, there weren't that many women. There weren't that many women in the kinds of jobs that I wanted to do, at any rate. I started at a little paper in Palo Alto, California, which 
was the world at its best, meaning equal number of women and men, everybody equal opportunity. I didn't even know until I got out into the wider world that it really wasn't that way. Many places, especially the old established newspapers. And so when I got to the Chicago Tribune, um, I became a national correspondent after a couple years in features. And I was the only, only female national correspondent. That wasn't a hardship, though. I mean, that's one of the interesting things. It was a situation, but it wasn't really a hardship. I realized that there were things I could actually do, situations I could penetrate, because I was, as Joan Didion once said, small and female and almost neurotically inarticulate. <laughs> Um, but it continues to perplex me and perturb me that even though there are a lot of women in a lot of great journalism jobs now, women still don't run very much. You know, it's, it's the case of everything everywhere, right? Um, there are not very many women at the very top. And there are not very many women in um, opinion jobs, jobs where you can just really express your own thoughts. The opinion page, I'm not, I don't write on the opinion page of the Tribune. I write on page, excuse me, three. So it's, it's a metro column as opposed to a purely opinion column. But most opinion columns are still written by men. So I don't know, do you, at, at your age, I mean, do you feel that there's a gender gap when you think about what you may want to do? Um, I think, especially at the Claremont Colleges, the gender gap is something that people are very aware of. Um, and it's, it really is apparent, I think, in a lot of 5C, or in a lot of, <laughs> there I said it, I said it, 5C. We know what you mean. Yeah, <laughs> 5C organizations. Um, there is a lot of female leadership, um, and I think it does still exist, but I think that it's getting a lot better. And um, I'm the first uh, non-Pomona, uh, or the second, the first Scripps um, editor-in-chief at the, at the Student Life, um, and this year has brought the first non-Pomona editor-in-chief. So leadership is shifting, and I think um, it's getting a lot better, and people are talking about it more, but it's definitely something that my generation is going to encounter. Um, and I guess also, so as a national correspondent, in Atlanta, and then later on as a regular columnist at the Chicago Tribune. How do you think your writing has evolved and your focuses have shifted? Um, does anybody here know who Mike Royko was? OK. So Mike Royko was the great Chicago columnist of his time, the great Metro columnist of his time. You know, a guy's guy, the cops, the bars. Um, he wrote a great column. He set the standard for a certain kind of columnist. And in his later days, he began to struggle. And people began to attack him. The Wall Street Journal, I think it was, did a piece on, you know, his decline, and I went in to see him one day. I wasn't really close to Mike, but he wanted me to come see him before I was about to go away for a year. And I went in, and I, I was, we talked for about an hour, you know, I, in the presence of his high holiness. I was trembling. Um, but one of the things that he said to me, he said, people don't understand that if you write a column for a very long time, your enthusiasms will change. And I've always held on to that, that word, your enthusiasms, because you don't want to be the columnist who writes the same column over and over and over and over. So, you know, I've gone through phases in my 22 years of writing a column three times a week. Um, sometimes it's more Chicago-focused than others. Sometimes it's harder-edged than others. Um, it just varies. I don't, I don't know quite where I am right now. <laughs> <laughs> so as a journalist, you are based in Chicago. Um, while your column can shift to more national focus or more regional focuses, how do you approach writing about Chicago, a city 
where we have crazy mayors and there's a lot of violence. Oh, and we don't say crazy. Well, some people would say crazy <laughs> mayors, <laughs> but not on this stage. <laughs> um, so what do you, how do you approach writing about Chicago? You know, I'm a, I'm a very visceral columnist, and I try to respond to what's going on, the city, on in the city you know, based on just some, some gut feeling that I have, combined with a fair amount of reporting. I go out into the city a lot. This is really important to me. A lot of columnists, there are different kinds of columns, right? So I'm not saying good, bad, I'm just, but a lot of columnists prefer to sit in the office, read other people's reports on things, and then react to that. That is one element of writing a column. I would much rather go out into the city. So if there has been a shooting in the city of Chicago, which there are too many of, though not as many probably as people who don't live there imagine, um, I want to go out to where it happened, and I want to talk to the neighbors, and I want to try to figure out what actually happened here, what are the dynamics behind it, rather than just having a knee-jerk reaction to it. Um, so going out into the city is one way I try to figure out what to write about. And then, uh, you know, there's also just the, the reading and the listening to people. We had a, an election for mayor not long ago. Some of you may have followed this. It was national news largely because of who was running for mayor, Rahm Emanuel. Um, and he was forced unexpectedly by many people into a runoff. Uh, against uh, a man named Jesus Chuy Garcia, a Mexican immigrant who still lived in the old neighborhood. So, you know, just as a story, this was, you know, the, the storyline of this. Rahm Emanuel, allied to Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, against Chuy Garcia, the Mexican immigrant from, you know, still living in the old neighborhood. Um, and it did reveal a lot about the city of Chicago. But what I found myself doing, in addition to you know, going out and trying to figure out what was going on, is just listening to the way people were talking about it. So I had a lot of friends, for example, say, I want Rahm Emanuel to stay on as mayor, but I want to send him a message. And so I'm going to vote for Chuy Garcia in the primary. So that's the kind of thing that as a columnist you just listen to. The polls don't necessarily tell you that, but you try to hear, you know, what are the psychological undercurrents that are going on in a place. Um, and in today's world where, um, as, as we've talked about, newspapers are becoming less and less common and uh, metro columnists are also dying out in some regards, how do you no, I don't like that phrase. Not dying, dying out. out. <laughs> not dying out. Um, but certainly shifting. Um, how do you see your role as a metro columnist? Well, you know, a metro columnist is a critter that evolved out of newspapers as we have known them. Um, Mike Royko being the classic example of the metro columnist. The guy, almost always used to be a guy, the guy who lives in the city, the guy who knows the cops and the firefighters and drinks and, you know, gets at the gritty city, um, sometimes is funny, sometimes makes you cry, sometimes writes about politics, sometimes writes about, in my case, the centipede in my bathtub. Um, you know, so, so that model, has been around for, for a while, but as newspapers move online, what I'm sensing is it's very hard to figure out where to put an old style metro columnist <coughs> in a digital publication. So the pressure is even greater than it used to be, I think, for columnists to find their niche. This is not new but I, I sense that it's accelerating. So that you need to be either the liberal columnist, the conservative columnist, the parenting columnist, the feminist columnist, 
the food columnist. I, yeah, I, th I, think it's, I think it's getting harder just in terms of trying to figure out where do you put this on a website, this old-fashioned, I write about everything because we all think about everything column. So while you, while you do write about a very wide variety of topics, um, do you have a particular area you enjoy writing about most? I really love it all. I mean, I love going out into the city. I love trying to explore, not in a touristy way, but in a really kind of psychological way, what is going on in, in the neighborhoods and finding the stories that allow those subtle things to be told. But I also like just writing the, you know, gosh, it's spring and the leaves are coming back on the trees. If you live in California, you don't know what I'm talking about. But if you live in a cold place, you know that there comes a time every year when that is the only thing that people are really thinking about. They are not thinking about politics. They are looking out their window and going, oh my god, I think that leaf is about to happen. <laughs> Um, and so when you approach writing a column, such as the column you wrote about um, the things you love about spring, um, what, what, what is your writing process? How do you choose what to write about? And how do you approach writing three columns per week? Well, I think of it as a, a process of highly refined panic. <laughs> do not underestimate the value of panic in the creative process. Um, I really work column to column, day to day. So I have deadlines three days a week, and I wake up on the mornings when I know that I must have a column by the end of the day. I wake up sick, <laughs> and then I lie there and I just think, receive, receive. And sometimes, it's like a little bird will land in your mind. I'm a great believer, seriously, for all of us, regardless of what we do in that what I've heard called morning mind, where very early in the morning, when you're not quite awake, but you're not asleep either, if you just rest for a little while, you have some really great ideas, which are different from the great ideas when, you're, when you wake up in the middle of the night. Those turn out usually to be really bad ideas. <laughs> <laughs> but the ones that bubble up is you're just waking up. Um, so a lot of times an idea will come to me that way. And then I get up and I go online, I read the papers and try to see what's in the news. I always look for the news first. Um, and then sometimes people will write me with an interesting story and thank them. Um, and on the topic of inspiration, um, one of your most widely known works is the, the column that you wrote, the essay that you wrote on sunscreen and um, a hypothetical graduation speech. What exactly inspired that speech? Panic. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not kidding you. I was walking to work. It was a Friday morning. It's my third column of the week. I had nothing to write about. Nothing. I'm a big believer of taking a walk when you're, when you're panicked, too. Um, and as I was walking to work, it was late May. It was still chilly, but there was a young woman sunbathing, and I thought, oh my God, she should be wearing sunscreen. <laughs> because I didn't at that age, and look what happened. And I got to work, and, and, and I just, as, as I was walking, I thought, you know, it's graduation time, and I have developed this, this chronic need to tell people in their late teens and 20s what they should be doing. Well, I could just dress that up. It's a graduation speech. So, got to work, sat down, spent the afternoon writing some stuff down, and that was it. Um, so, looking back at um, your perception of the graduation experience when you were a student um, versus the one that um, students are facing now, how do you think? Um, the experience of com coming out of college has changed or evolved since then? My sense of it is that in 1975, we thought we had some time to fool around. And a lot of us did. 
you know, people went to Europe or they got a waitressing job. Or, there wasn't the same, what I sense now, um, urgency to get out there in the world. At the same time, I know that it's a lot of people graduating from college and not getting jobs. But, but, but I think we were more relaxed about the idea that, you know, I could go to France for a year. I could just be me for a year. Um, or in my case, you know, I'll get a job in Pomona admissions and then something else will happen. I, I think we had a different sense of urgency, less urgency. Am I wrong? Um, no, I think, I think now especially just, I mean, myself included, people feel pressure to meet these expectations that we feel are set for us. And there's a need to come out and get jobs and be accomplished and know what you want to do. Um, which is sometimes contradictory, I think, to the liberal, I mean, it's completely contradictory right. to the liberal arts experience. Right. So it is kind of an interesting um, dichotomy and difference. Um, but I guess, is this, would you like to read your column for us? Do you want me to? Okay. I would. <laughs> I have to find it here. Hang on. And I guess while you're looking for it, um, surrounding this column, um, there is some controversy and um, surrounding Kurt Vonnegut and discussion about that. So could you tell us the story about what exactly happened? Yeah, there's no real short version of that, but I'll try to make it really short. Um, so I wrote this column in 1997, and a couple months later, um, I started getting emails from people telling me that they were getting this in their email, but now it was labeled as Kurt Vonnegut's graduation address to MIT. But they remembered having read it in the Chicago Tribune. So they were trying to figure out who stole what from whom, right? Because the way people think, there must always be a villain. It wouldn't be possible that it was actually what it was. It was just a freakish event. No one knows to this day who took my name off this column, put Kurt Vonnegut's name on it, and then it went viral. It was one, maybe, maybe the first viral thing out there on, the, on, on the, the, the internet hardly existed. I hate to even say internet, in email. There were chat rooms then. Email was very new. 1997, there were still a fair number of people who did not have email. I had had email for one year at that point. So people were very credulous about what they got in their email. Well, if I got it in my email, it must be true. <laughs> Want me to read this? Oh, yes, that'd be great. Ladies and gentlemen, of the graduating class. Wear sunscreen. If I could offer you only one tip for the future, sunscreen would be it. The long-term benefits of sunscreen have been proved by scientists, whereas the rest of my advice has no basis more reliable than my own meandering experience. I will dispense this advice now. Enjoy the power and beauty of your youth. Oh, never mind. You will not understand the power and beauty of your youth until they faded. But trust me, in 20 years, you'll look back at photos of yourself and recall in a way you can't grasp now how much possibility lay before you and how fabulous you really looked. <laughs> you are not as fat as you imagine. Don't worry about the future, or worry, but know that worrying is as effective as trying to solve an algebra equation by chewing bubble gum. The real troubles in your life are apt to be things that never crossed your worried mind, the kind that blindside you at 4 p.m. on some idle Tuesday. Do one thing every day that scares you. Sing. Don't be reckless with other people's hearts. Don't put up with people who are reckless with yours. Floss. Don't waste your time on jealousy. Sometimes you're ahead, sometimes you're behind. 
The race is long, and in the end, it's only with yourself. Remember compliments you receive. Forget the insults. If you succeed in doing this, tell me how. <laughs> Keep your old love letters. Throw away your old bank statements. Stretch. Don't feel guilty if you don't know what you want to do with your life. The most interesting people I know didn't know at 22 what they wanted to do with their lives. Some of the most interesting 40-year-olds I know still don't. Get plenty of calcium. Be kind to your knees. You'll miss them when they're gone. Maybe you'll marry. Maybe you won't. Maybe you'll have children. Maybe you won't. Maybe you'll divorce at 40. Maybe you'll dance the funky chicken on your 75th wedding anniversary. Whatever you do, don't congratulate yourself too much or berate yourself either. Your choices are half chance. So are everybody else's. Enjoy your body. Use it every way you can. Don't be afraid of it or of what other people think of it. It's the greatest instrument you will ever own. Dance, even if you have nowhere to do it but your own living room. Read the directions, even if you don't follow them. Do not read beauty magazines. <laughs> they will only make you feel ugly. Get to know your parents. You never know when they'll be gone for good. Be nice to your siblings. They're your best link to your past and the people most likely to stick with you in the future. Understand that friends come and go, but with a precious few, you should hold on. Work hard to bridge the gaps in geography and lifestyle, because the older you get, the more you need the people you knew when you were young. Live in New York City once, but leave before it makes you hard. Live in Northern California once, but leave before it makes you soft travel. Accept certain inalienable truths. Prices will rise. Politicians will philander. You, too, will get old. And when you do, you'll fantasize that when you were young, prices were reasonable, politicians were noble, and children respected their elders. Respect your elders. Don't expect anyone else to support you. Maybe you have a trust fund. Maybe you'll have a wealthy spouse. But you never know when either one might run out. Don't mess too much with your hair. Or by the time you're 40, it will look 85. Be careful whose advice you buy. But be patient with those who supply it. Advice is a form of nostalgia. Dispensing it as a way of fishing the past from the disposal, wiping it off, painting over the ugly parts, and recycling it for more than it's worth. But trust me on the sunscreen. Thank you for reading that. And Mary, I have to tell you, we, listen, we actually listened to your column on tape in the office the other day, and um, I listened to this in particular with a friend of mine who's graduating, and there was a wonderful moment when we were both listening to it, and kind of, we talked about it afterwards, and it was a great feeling of kind of comfort, but also just thoughtfulness and hope for the future, so it's a wonderful column, and I think it's so pertinent to everything, especially as college students that we're experiencing. Um, that it's okay not to know what you're going to do with your life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm wondering, how, what was your experience like putting all of those um, anecdotes, experiences, pieces of life together in that column? You know, as I said, I, I wrote that in an afternoon. And I, I, think, I think all of us carry a lot around in us that we never have occasion to express. And, or at least to express in one coherent place. And 
part of the beauty of writing a column is that it forces you to take things from out of here and out of here and put them out there. Um, I also, and this will sound corny, but I think it was Rodin, I'm not comparing myself to Rodin, but you know, I think it was Rodin who said that the, the job of a sculptor is not to sculpt the rock, it's to find the sculpture that is already in it. And that's how I sometimes feel when I write. Every now and then when I feel that I've said what I'm trying to say, it is very difficult to say what you want to say. It is very rare that those words really reflect what's in here. But every now and then when that happens, when it comes close, I always feel like I found something. It's like I was walking along and I picked it up and, oh, there's that column. It's right there, already. All I got to do is just brush the sand off. It's there. Do you have a favorite piece of writing or a column that you've written? No. <laughs> you know, really, it's just a, it's a hash of words in my head. So I, I don't even remember a lot of it. And what is it that you love most about being a journalist? Engaging the world just the chance to go out. It is like being forever at Pomona College, but in a way I didn't understand when I actually was at Pomona College, because I was too busy walking around behind wig crying, right? <laughs> uh, no, but it's just, you know, it, it, it's, an, it's an occasion to go out and try to understand the world and then translate the world for other people, for myself. It's a way, it, again, I know this sounds a little hoo-hoo, but it, it is about connecting people, about connecting ideas, and connecting me to the world, and the world to me. It's, I, I love the way journalism practices a certain way, and there's more than one way to practice it, right? But that it does connect. And now, thinking about the education that you got at Pomona, how do you think that that's shaped your work as a journalist or how you've approached other aspects of your life? I think Pomona opened up the world to me. Um, it had been open to me in other ways. My mother had a very wide mind. You know, I grew up reading a lot, but I didn't go to good schools. I didn't have the kind of education that so many people come to Pomona College with. Um, but at Pomona, there were so many different kinds of people, and there was just this atmosphere of ideas and learning. And I think I took away from it the idea you didn't have to learn it all right then, right now, because God knows I didn't. <laughs> um, but it, it, it was, it was a, a, a way of approaching the world, of learning, of just learning until you can't learn anymore. Yeah. Do you have a favorite class or um, that you are especially reminded of? Virginia Crosby's French 51 class. <laughs> you know, Virginia, um, I took Virginia's French 51 class my first semester at Pomona. It was at 8 a.m. Most of the time I didn't get up. Um, I didn't really study. I think she gave me a B minus, and I was shocked. And then Stan Hale's here. I took calculus my first semester. I think uh, I won't even say what I got in calculus. <laughs> um, but I still remember those, those classes really fondly because they were at the beginning of my understanding that you actually had to work at stuff. And I had professors who made me feel cared for, even when they were giving me those bad grades. <laughs> and now coming back, how do you think things have changed over time? Um, you know, it's, it's oh, everyone I know, we like to joke and say we could never get into Pomona College now. 
uh, you know, I still think the, the, the level of the students are, you know, is really high. Um, and, and I don't have any, any way to really judge what, what goes on in, in the student experience so much. Um, I'm always struck by how much remains the same, even though I'm also struck by, I think I was saying this to you earlier, there's nothing wild left at Pomona. You know, when, when we were here, there seemed to be just a lot of wildness at the edges of it, right? You went across Baseline, and it was orange groves, and you went to the wash, and it was just kind of chaotic, and um, it's a less chaotic place now. <laughs> um, and do you have any um, other fond memories of Pomona or things that you've really enjoyed coming back to and being here? I love being able to walk back on this campus and feel at home. And I think that that is part of the continuity that is the gift of Pomona. That even though, you know, the buildings may change, um, that it continues to have a, a mellow, open feeling to it and that you can come back here 40 years later and still feel part of it. Yeah, that community is still so, it's such a great feeling here and it's yeah. very present, I think, still. Um, I always wonder how the students are looking at us. I, I didn't put the 40th reunion on my tag because, I, not I will, but but it's like, I knew they would be looking at us like, God, she's so old. <laughs> um, and uh, you, so you've come back in the past, um, every few years you've been back. Um, any um, favorite experiences you've had coming back as an alum? I came back not long ago for um, a memorial for Jack Quinlan. Does anybody remember Jack? I know some of you. you know, Jack uh, taught chemistry and then he ran the admissions office for a while. And um, again, it was just really nice to be here. I mean, I was very sad to have lost Jack, but it was really nice to, to be here and feel that there was still some community around Jack Quinlan in his early 80s. Um, well, I think that's all. <laughs>